Hello, friends. Hello, 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 friends. A tradition unlike any other. Oh, 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 oh my goodness. In your life have you seen anything like that? There it is! Adam Scott, a life changer. Mashed potato! Hear it, hear it, hear it. Here it comes. The team at Cobra Golf are set to introduce additions to its collection of king putters, making the offerings available in a sleek black colorway, the perfect complement to the limited edition black LTDX drivers and king black wedges. The lineup of black putters includes both king 3D printed and king vintage series models, along with two new mallet styles, the king Cuda and Cuda 40. All King Collection putters come standard with the Cobra Superstroke Traction Tour 2.0 grip and KBS Tour 120 shaft. The new additions to the King 3D printed and vintage series will be available from July this year. For more information on the entire King family of products, visit cobragolf.com. This is the 19th T podcast. We are officially back after a couple of weeks of sporadic programming whilst my co-host and and great friend uh drew's to traverse across the uh, land of the free home of the brave uh he's back from the honeymoon just in time for the biggest week on the golfing calendar drew sir it's an absolute pleasure to have you back in my ears it's exciting to be back kn uh it's been a little while to be honest i mean it's, it's nearly been two months by the time we we uh work our way back to sort of having the week off leading into the wedding, which was back in mid-Feb. So uh, great to have you over here in Perth for that and see you in the flesh. But uh, And it's also great to be back in the ears of our very, very loyal listeners. Some great episodes across the last month as well if people haven't gone back and listened. So I encourage everyone to do that. Certainly. Uh, and will be plenty to come as well. We certainly intend on doing uh, not only a comprehensive review of the Australian summer, which wrapped up over the weekend with Tom Powell Horan's victory at the National, the season-ending tournament at the National, uh, confirming uh, not only his place, um, but also Andrew Martin and our good mate David Michaluzzi as the three wrapping up their DP World Tour cards. Uh, so we'll have a comprehensive review of the Australian summer. I might even try to lock in a chat with Micka as our winner of the Order of Merit from the summer next week. Um, alongside that, we intend on doing a comprehensive review of Drudes' trip. So <laughs> I had a bit of a brainstorm while you're away, uh, and I have subsequently put a few topics for consideration to mm. you um, of your four or five weeks in the States. So that'll be a bit more – I mean, there'll be a little bit of golf in that, but that'll mm. be a bit more general travel yes. uh, and general life, uh, I think, which should be very entertaining. So both of those – Coming next week, but of course, uh, as I alluded to at the very top, the biggest week on the annual golfing calendar, certainly in my humble opinion. I know we've been a little divided on this in the past, whether it's the Masters or the Open Championship, but but whichever way you spin it, it is one of, if not uh, the most significant, the most important week on the calendar as all eyes and attention turn to Augusta National. Mm. Um, Just briefly before we get into traditional Preview, Drudes. Um, two other things over the weekend. It'd be remiss not to mention uh, very briefly a uh, good friend of this podcast uh, and one of the great characters of Australian golf, Dimi Papadados, was a runner up in a one hole playoff in his maiden appearance on the Corn Ferry Tour in the uh, Chile Open in Santiago over the weekend. So not only does he take home uh, $90,000 US courtesy of his second place finish, um, but goes a long way to securing a bit more status on that tour. He's projected, I think, to be around about 16th or 17th on the money list after that finish. Um, We'll not only sew up a few more starts on the Corn Ferry Tour, but obviously you place yourself within the top 25 at the end of that season. You go straight up to the PGA Tour. So a ripping start to Dimmy's Corn Ferry Tour career, uh, and we'll keep a close eye on that as the season progresses. And then uh, we're talking about Augusta National, of course, for the Men's Masters this week, Trudes, but it's not and the first bit of golf we've seen uh, in this significant week at uh, the greatest golf property on on the planet. We had the Augusta National Women's Amateur run over the weekend just gone. For those unfamiliar, I think it was in its fourth year, I believe, uh, that event. It was the brainchild of Fred Ridley, uh, the chairman of Augusta National, to see further opportunities not only for amateurs, but specifically for women at what has traditionally been a closed-door 
uh, for women in the past Augusta National. It's a great um, initiative. It's a great event. Uh, it sees the first two rounds of a three-round tournament played at the Champions Retreat course, which is about 20 minutes away from Augusta National. Uh, there's three nines there uh, and aptly named Champions Retreat because the three nines are designed by Jack uh, Jack Nicholas, Gary Player, and, of course, the King Arnold Palmer. So they play the Nicholas nine and the Palmer nine across the first two days. Then there is a cut and a portion of the field plays Augusta National on the Sunday having played a practice round there on the Saturday. We had two Australians, uh, Drews are involved in the women's amateur, uh, Justice Bozio, uh, who has taken all before her really recently in uh, women's amateur events here in Australia, and Janice Wong, the highly touted amateur out of Melbourne. Unfortunately, both did not feature at Augusta National on the Sunday. Uh, Justice Bozio missed the cut by one shot, unfortunately, uh, with her coach Richard Woodhouse on the back. Uh, Janith Wong ended up uh, two strokes back, missing the cut by three, but uh, certainly didn't uh, do themselves any harm on the world stage. I mean, uh, a tough course is the Champions Retreat, and not everyone gets to play at uh, Augusta National in that tournament format. So no shame in the way they play, but just wanted to make mention of those two. Uh, the tournament was won um, not comfortably in the end. She entered Augusta <laughs> National with a six-stroke lead after the first two rounds. Did the world's highest-ranked women's amateur player, Rose Zhang, Ended up winning on the first playoff hole uh, over Jenny Bay. But she is, uh, I think that's five wins in her last six starts and a total of eight or nine so far in an amateur career going on to carve out one of the the greatest amateur careers and probably quite comfortable with the greatest college golf careers uh, there's ever been. Dreads is Rose Zhang, and she's one to certainly watch for the future. Mm. Not wrong. The wheels were falling off a little bit on the last day and uh, went into wow. a playoff. So I think it was uh, I think it was four over in the on the final day or something like that to... Get into that playoff, but uh, held her nerve and uh, won on the second playoff hole. So, yeah, as you said, comfortably, yeah, one of the great amateur um, amateur players. Um, I'm pretty certain she's at Stanford. Um, she is. At the minute, yes. yeah, and she's, um, yeah, got had some fantastic teammates, Rachel Heck and, and mm. the likes that have gone through Stanford at the minute. So, yeah, pretty impressive amateur career. Uh, no doubt she'll be turning pro pretty soon, I would suggest. Relatively shortly, uh, and I think winning tournaments, uh, maybe not with as much relative ease on the LPGA, mm-hmm. um, but certainly she'll rack up plenty, I would say, before her career is done. Uh, Drew, so post the women's amateur, of course, all attention turns to the Masters Tournament of 2023. So many interesting wrinkles this mm-hmm. year, Drew, whether it's uh, the first time we see the live players uh, join up again with the PGA Tour players in a, mm-hmm. in a major, mm-hmm. uh, whether it's the changes to the courses, primarily the the lengthening of the 13th hole by virtue of moving the, the tee box back a significant margin. There's, there's a lot of different storylines, I suppose, going into this week. Yeah. Question without notice, mm. what's your, what's your favourite? What are you looking forward to watching the most? Well, I, I think undoubtedly it's, it's the Live VPGA thing. I think it's just going to be it, – it's been a talking point for so long uh, now, and it's the first time really that we've seen since the um, exodus, for, for lack of a term, from the PGA Tour. It's the first time that the players have really come back together, and, and I'm obviously talking about post the Open Championship when Cam Smith had gone. So I think uh, in two ways I'm very interested to see uh, how – uh, I guess the relationship there between the PGA players and the live players, obviously we've seen some ongoing comments between, uh, between players. Obviously we, we had the Rory and Patrick Reed thing in, um, in the middle East and uh, not all that long ago, um, which is probably perhaps more to do with other things in Patrick Reed's life um, than, than the live piece. But I'm also interested to see how the live players actually play and perform. Um, I think a little part of me wanted to put any live player to we, was as my want to win just for the pure shit housery of what we would, you know, what we would see. Um, so yeah, I, I'm really interested to see how the live players actually perform because, you know, hand on heart, I haven't actually watched any of the live stuff, um, online, um, cause it's, it's not particularly all that interesting to me and that's just personal opinion. So I'm interested to see how they come in and, and play. So yeah, I guess that's kind of my main storyline that I'm, really interested in but as you said there's so many um uh, across 
the course of, of a Masters, you know, Rory chasing the Grand Slam. Um, Spieth, of course, just, you know, really having turned his game around. Scotty Scheffler, can he do it again? There's there's so many different little pieces that you can put together. Will Cam Smith finally get it done? Um, you know, there's there's so many pieces to the puzzle that I, I think come with the Masters week. So that's kind of mine. Where's your head at in terms of uh, storylines? What's any sticking out in your mind? Yeah, I think pr- probably just before I I get to where my attention is going to be, uh, I think just on the live piece, uh, undoubtedly it's it's the through line probably mm-hmm. uh, that will dominate at least the early part of the week. I think it's natural um, just by the fact we haven't seen it. We haven't seen the groups co-mingle up until this point. Uh, yeah. And that will increase as the week Goes on. I mean, uh, Cam Smith carried a relatively heavy burden um, today. So we're recording this Tuesday night. Um, today, Australian Tommy carried a relatively heavy burden as the first live player to front a press conference. Uh, now, how did you know, he go? That, that gets scheduled you... by the talk. Uh, how did he go? Yeah. Well, I, I've I've watched probably highlights. I didn't necessarily okay. watch it end to end. I've mm-hmm. watched snippets and highlights. I thought he handled himself incredibly well. Um, I don't necessarily think the line of questioning was. Um, out of order in any way, um, aggressive or unnecessary. I think they were natural questions to be asked. Uh, I think he did a really good job. Essentially, where he kind of landed was, you know, I didn't really know what to expect. Evidently, this was his first day on on the property uh, and he went and practised before he fronted um, the media in the press hall and he kind of said, I didn't really know what to expect to be honest with you, turning up today. Uh, he said, I've just spent an hour out in the range and it was an hour filled with um, handshakes and smiles and laughs and in some cases hugs. Uh, it was a really pleasant hour to be back around people I've not seen in some time. Um, I don't hold any animosity towards them and they don't seemingly hold any animosity towards me. So uh, he was kind of, and said it nearly in as many words, whatever I suppose acrimony there is perceived to be between the two groups is is a construct of the group of people sitting in front of me right now, yeah. which to an extent I think is true. Um, I, I don't necessarily buy all into that because there has been comments from both sides, not least of which from Rory, who's essentially been beating the drum mm-hmm. for the PGA Tour that have been relatively critical of individuals um, on the live side and, and conversely, um, you know, there are players on the live side who are quite literally litigious and yeah. and suing um, individuals in the PGA Tour side. So I don't necessarily buy completely into the fact that any bitterness is a complete construct of the media, but he, yeah, he fronted that really well. Uh, and I think that speaks volumes of him. Uh, I think being very comfortable in the decision that he's made and the reasons that he made it, but also pretty comfortable within his own skin. I think that's been always evident of Cameron Smith that he's unapologetic fiercely unapologetic for who he is. Um, and I think that's that's a wonderful quality that he has. Whether or not it helps him pull on a green jacket on Monday morning Australian time remains to be seen. I, mm. I think it's a fascinating fascinating wrinkle that you've mentioned about whether or not they'll be competitive. Um, yeah, there is the argument that the level and the standard of golf that they're playing may not necessarily produce the performances required to challenge uh, on the back nine on on Sunday American time, I think realistically that's probably true for a great many of the group. Um, whether that's by virtue of age, like a, a Mickelson or a Garcia, or you know to an extent a Neustazen, um, to form, Deschambeau is a shadow of his former self, not just in pounds but also in talent um, at present. Um, Brooks Koepka is probably in the same boat, albeit he just won the event on the weekend in Orlando. Um, I think realistically, Drew, to be honest, it's it's probably Smith and Johnson who you would relatively expect as, you know, a past champion in, in DJ's case and a person in Cam who's, who's played exceptionally well every time he's, he's, he's entered the property there. You would expect to, to be there and thereabouts. The two that fascinate me um, are Abraham Answer and Joaquin Neiman mm-hmm. because uh, probably more so Neiman um, because – as much as I love Abe, he's never really had the game at a major. But, you know, one of Neiman's final acts on the PGA Tour was winning, winning at Riviera, um, you know, widely regarded as uh, one of, if not the most significant events on the PGA Tour outside of a major in the players. 
incredibly young, hits the ball long, stripes his irons, whether or not he can find the putter. Those are the kind of the bracket of guys that I'm fascinated in because I don't expect much of the others. And I do expect, you know, the aforementioned two in Johnson and Smith to be there and thereabouts. Mm-hmm. So it's probably the guys in the middle that I have the most intrigue around and how they play. Um, yeah, just, just kind of probably what's been ruminating in my head from a live perspective. I, I think the best thing though will be I do get the distinct sense that once the golf gets underway, that kind of falls to the wayside. And I hope mm. that's the case because it should really be the golf that does the talking across the four days. Yeah. Uh, I think there is there, there is undoubtedly going to be the undertone all week, right? Whether it gets mentioned in the broadcast or not is going to be another fascinating piece. You know, we, we know how sort of um, – how much censorship there is in in, in a P, in the uh, Masters broadcast, whether they're going to wear team uniforms, you know, things like this. I think it's just going to be fascinating. And um, my my point before was kind of more around, you know, having a look at their form, but also they haven't played four round tournaments for, mm. for quite some time now. So how will that affect come Sunday if one of them's in the hunt? Like, there's just so many little interesting storylines along the way um and yeah i think you know we'll, we'll get to the weather in a minute and i think the weather's going to play a massive role in in the week um as well so yeah heaps heaps to unpack i think it's going to be one of the more action-packed uh masters that we've had for quite some time i agree um that's a really long-winded way of getting to what intrigues me or interests me the most <laughs> um heading into this weekend um I, I honestly I think it's the thirteenth hole. And mm-hmm. I think it's probably not just that hole itself, but the ripple effects I believe it has on the back nine, particularly, you know, come Sunday. So obviously you'd have to be living under a rock to um not realise that they've lengthened the thirteenth hole uh, and they've lengthened it at the tee box by moving it back a considerable way. That's been coming, you know, telegraphed by a series of satellite um, Google Earth images for some years now about, you know, the purchase and then subsequent clearing of land, um, you know, behind the road that ran behind the previous tee box. And mm. you look at it now, you know, the photos really started emerging at the beginning of the week, people playing practice rounds there. And um, it's a shoot, not all too dissimilar to the 18th. Like it's mm-hmm. narrow. That's the that's the first thing I noticed from the T now is it's a long, narrow shoot. Now, I don't think it's as stark as the 18th, but certainly um, immediately my mind went to, um, you know, comfortably my favourite player and comfortably his greatest weakness uh, and how nervous I will be if Jordan Spieth is there or thereabouts at the lead on Sunday when he steps up to the tee box at 13. Mm-hmm. And having no confidence um, that it won't go either far left or far right, mm. and not make it out of the shoot. Mm. Um, so you know that's a challenge in and of itself. Um, I think what the length does as well, and I've heard several players talk about this now. Um, Scotty Scheffler's mentioned it. Patrick Cantlay's mentioned it. What the old tee shot um, almost forced you, not even invited you, really forced you to do was turn the ball over right to left. Uh, so most players would take a three wood off the old tee, and and draw the ball left around the corner and begin to run it down the hill. Uh, now, by virtue of the lengthening, a three wood is almost obsolete because you don't get far enough. You won't get beyond the corner or really even to the corner mm. to make a viable second shot. So everyone's taking driver, and the point that they've they've made is that there'll be not really any shot shaping because no one has the ability to turn the ball uh, right to left that distinctly and still hit the ball, you know, 300 plus yards with the driver. So I think it's really interesting what it does in terms of not only the first shot, it lengthens the second shot now. You know, you'll be taking mid irons as opposed to um, long or even wedges in that second shot. So the 13th becomes fascinating in the sense to me that um, you used to talk about getting through 11, 12, 13, even par, and going on a run. But more often than not, guys would find a way to pick up a shot on 13, you know, and that became particularly important if they dropped it on 12. Mm. But I genuinely believe now par through those three holes will be significant. And the ripple effect of that, uh, and it's taken me um, a traditionally long time to get to my point, 
I think the ripple effect of that, Drudes, the 15th, I think, becomes maybe the most significant hole on the course in the final round. Because traditionally speaking, players would try and get through 12 unscathed on Sunday, and then they'd chase shots on 13 and 15 and to a lesser extent, 16. The pin placement is favourable on Sunday. You know, that funnel pin that you can work the ball back down at 16. Mm. But guys would chase birdies on 13 and 15. Now, by virtue of lengthening 13 and par being a more than respectable score on that hole, I actually think it makes 15 far more fascinating than it already is Mm -hmm. because that becomes your hole. You don't want to be, you know, you don't want to be getting through 15 and still needing to pick up two shots because you might get one on 16. But 17 and 18 become difficult holes to be chasing shots. So the amount of guys that I think now on Sunday will chase an eagle on 15. That second shot on 15, I think, will be intriguing Mm. to watch with guys, you know, either at the lead or two or three shots back with four to play. Mm. Yeah, I, I, it's it's another another thing to add for for this week to watch, and and all your points are absolutely valid. And I think what's sad about it is that it's going to increase scores. Right on thirteen, I think I was reading before it's the most birdied and eagle eagled hole in the past five years. So, unfortunately, for a lot of people who perhaps don't understand golf as well as what the people who live and breathe it are they're going to see this and go, mm, we don't need to roll the ball back. We'll just length, lengthen holes. And now that's not possible at every every golf course, right? Because what it's going to do, right? right we, you're going to see it. You, people are going to have to hit long irons and three woods and, and mid irons into 13, as you, as you aptly pointed out. And it's going to make it fascinating to watch. What I don't like is where, where it will take the direction of architecture in the future. So I think that's just another piece to, to be mindful of. Um, and I think Augusta kind of knows that as well a little bit. They had to make a, make a choice. So, yeah, it'd be interesting to see how it kind of affects the entire back nine to to your point there. So plenty to, plenty to watch. Is, yeah, I mean, bifurcation is is also a topic that popped up um, mm. while you're on your travels, which is probably something we'll get to. But I did I, – not tonight, I should – preface uh, because this is a master's preview pod this is not a bifurcation pod um i, I will say though i found it really interesting um patrick cantley when i heard the comments about not necessarily shaping the ball off the tee at 13 anymore by virtue of the length uh, that was part of a broader interview he did on the no laying up podcast which was fascinating to listen to his thoughts around the proposal by the usga and the rna around um you know a Local um, model, local rule and MLR around the ball, um, you know. And it, the point was put to him that there aren't many courses in the world who can afford to buy land mm. simply to lengthen a hole. And his response was, "There's only one course in the world that can afford to buy land to lengthen a hole." Yeah. So I, I certainly agree with your point, and I tend to think you're right in the sense that it'll become overly reductive. The opinion that they have found the answer. The problem being is they're the only ones. Yeah. You know, they're literally a billion dollar <laughs> organization. The only ones who can afford to have that solution to an existing problem. So yeah, really, really um, interesting to watch how that plays out over the four days, but particularly for me on Sunday. Yeah. Heaps to watch. Heaps to watch this weekend and week starting today <laughs> for that matter. Um, let's start with the weather. Uh-huh. which is something that I always uh, defer to you. Uh, uh-huh. You are much more in the clouds in a variety of different ways than I am, uh, Drewster. So <laughs> talk to us about what we're looking at for the four days from uh, from Thursday local time, Friday morning Australian time. What I will say, and, and I'll preface this weather report, uh, is that having just come back from the US at the minute, we probably haven't heard about it particularly much here in Australia, but they are experiencing unseasonably bad weather across the country. Um, an atmospheric river is what it's been referred to. I've got no idea what any of that means, but essentially what it means is that it rains a lot. So uh, LA has been experiencing 
very, very cold and wet winters, which is un- unseasonable. Lake Tahoe, which is on the border of Nevada and California, was cut off. Um, they've had in excess of 100 inches of snow in, in weeks. Uh, Yosemite National Park similarly was closed uh, due to the snowfall. So it's making its way across the entire country. So pretty much everywhere, even when we were in Nashville, uh, everywhere was essentially saying this is very unusual weather. So um, it is in in turn uh, going to affect the Masters because um, that will now flow on. So starting on Thursday, uh, Thursday is going to be a really important day of play. Thursday is the best looking day at the minute. 30 degrees, um, potential of a, a, a shower and a thunderstorm, uh, 77% humidity and, and light winds. So that's Thursday's forecast. Why that's important is because then on Friday, uh, rain showers all through the morning and afternoon, uh, around six millimetres of rain. Um, and winds picking up to 25 kilometres an hour. That only gets worse on Saturday. The winds will stay at a similar level, but the rainfall will increase to 12 mil uh, before reducing back on on Sunday uh, to a 60% chance of showers. Now, Friday and Saturday are obviously going to be very wet and windy. Um, Of course, we know that they have the the technology under the greens to help dry them out. But 18 mil of rain in, in two days is a lot of rain. Um, so I'm thinking, you know, perhaps it's not going to be as soft as what the 2020 COVID Masters was in November, but I'm certainly thinking that it's not going to be the traditional hard, fast greens that, that we're used to seeing. So, yeah, Thursday is going to be really important for players to get away to a good start. And it wouldn't, wouldn't it all be surprising to see whoever the players are that are, you know, at the top of the leaderboard after Thursday will be the ones there come Sunday, just purely from a, from weather perspective, because it'll be uh, too far back to, to chase with the wind and, and the poor conditions. So yeah, an interesting weather report compared to what we normally deliver in terms of Augusta uh, being normally it's around the, in the mid twenties and, and humid. Uh, and mm. this time we're going to, we're going to cop the rain, unfortunately. Sounds as though you want to be um, not only making the most of the good weather on Thursday, but therefore being in probably the first half of the draw. Yes. Um, because getting out early will be important. Uh, we, we do know that, um, you know, Tiger was dealt no favours last year from a weather perspective, having the uh, late early Thursday, Friday. So you probably want to be, by the sounds of it, early, late um, to get yourself out to a little bit of a a lead in the first round and then hopefully hold on. I do find that fascinating. Um, you know, you, you kind of at the dovetail there mentioned the 2020 um, Masters tournament, of course, played in September. Therefore, um, did I say the November, fall, did I? Not the spring. Yeah. Uh, I said November. Mate. It was regardless. Yeah. It was it was in the back half of the year. Yeah, it was played. It was played in the fall, as opposed to naturally in the spring. And we saw how soft that was. Uh, I did see a number of hoodies being worn today in practice rounds, which would speak to the unseasonable cold at this time of year. What pricked my ears up, Druids, um, was the wind. Mm. Now. The 2020 Masters, which saw DJ win, I can't remember, it was 20-something under. Mm, uh, I feel like it was 22 or 23 yeah. under. Um, was 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 soft and, and still. And a big part of the reason why he was able to go out pins and score was not just how easy it was to stop the ball within close proximity of the hole, but the lack of any other element causing you um, to pause and think the wind is fascinating here because there'll be a temptation with the softness to to throw darts at pins. Mm. However, I think the wind plays a factor, which probably, um, of course, I never look at the weather. I always wait for your report when you tell me in real time. So that probably has me rethinking some of my selections, <laughs> uh, probably most significantly my roughy. Okay. Um, because I'm now looking at players who play well uh, in those sorts of conditions. But we will get there. Um, 
Truth to the Australians is probably the next uh, most obvious place to start. A number in uh, the field, uh, I think it's probably worth leading off with uh, the amateur, Harrison Crow, uh, the boy out of New South Wales, who, of course, uh, gets his start by virtue of his win at the Asian Amateur last year. He has remained an amateur for this very week. I think um, that was something he was very clear about the moment he won the Asian Amateur, uh, was that any suggestion of turning pro was going to be delayed until at least the end of this week to experience uh, a childhood dream. So great to see Harrison Crow. Um, he stays, of course, in the Crow's Nest, uh, which is the accommodation and lodging in the clubhouse for the amateurs, and that will be a wonderful experience for him. Uh, saw a great interview uh, with his dad, I think it was Evan Priest spoke to him. <laughs> Sensational. Uh, I can't remember the quote, but essentially what was along the lines of, um, I've been watching the Masters since long before Norman was bombing them, uh, and it'll be a great pleasure to go and watch my son walk around that course. So he sounds like an absolute firecracker, does Mr. Crow, uh, and I'm sure it'll be a memorable week for both Harrison and his father. Uh, in terms of other Australians in the field, of course, uh, Adam Scott, uh, a former champion, the only Australian to wear a green jacket. We've mentioned Cameron Smith, uh, of course, by virtue of not only he, he remains in the top 50 in the world, but of his exemption as the defending Open champion and the most recent winner of a men's major. Uh, Jason Day, Drewster, is a fascinating one for me because, you know, Probably even cast your mind back 12 months. I was going to say 18, but probably even 12 months to say that Jason Day was a genuine consideration uh, at the Masters uh, would have been laughable, to be honest. But he has been in sensational touch, a run of top 10s. Um, I think he shot out to a 3-0 and start in the Dell match play and was all over Scotty Scheffler mm. in their matchup before eventually fading away in that he it looks a different player mm. uh, in the last probably eight months now. And for a guy who has played well previously at this course, who enters as undoubtedly one of the form players in the game at present, is, is worthy of genuine consideration this week. I agree. I, I absolutely agree. I think 26 Dollars is unders though. I feel oh, so do I. that's he was real <laughs> short, particularly when you look at the people who are behind that, including uh, a previous Masters winners in Hideki Matsuyama and um, yeah, there's some names. Uh, Matt Fitzpatrick who won a major last year is it yes. 46? So yeah, 26 seems short, but uh, no doubt you cannot doubt doubt form, uh, and he's been in good form. Uh, as of late, which is which is pleasing to see because you know I think I think you're right. Going back sort of 12, 18 months ago, we weren't really even talking about Jason Day, and sort of twenty four months ago, perhaps we were we were sort of saying where where is he at? Is he ready mm. to start pulling back in his career? So it is really pleasing to see. Um, and uh, yeah, he's proving a lot of doubters from two years ago, which would probably include you and I, um, wrong. Which is really really good to see. Just on that. Um... Price point. Uh, I thought I was really smart. I was coming in all prepared to tip him as my roughy because I thought, like, I mean, easy money. Like, he'll easily yeah. be paying late 40s into yeah. mid 50s, and he looks sensational at the moment. And I'm fairly confident, not only by the price that you've rattled off for him, but the price you've rattled off for Matt Fitzpatrick, that you and I are probably looking at the same provider. <laughs> uh, and they do have a track record of. Finding the Australians high up in the betting yes. order, irrespective of uh, probably the others around them. So I was yeah. unsurprised actually when I logged into um, said provider to find Jason Day at twenty six dollars today. Uh, albeit a little disappointed that I couldn't use him as my roughy. Roughy, yeah, sure, sure. Um, the the other Australian in the field is of course Minwoo Lee, who receives his second invitation, um, second consecutive invitation, and second all time invitation. To the Masters, uh, he does so um, by virtue of the top 50 in the world exemption, um, which uh, I was going to say uh, snuck into it. Not really. He's probably pretty comfortably now in in, in the 40s, uh, and that's off the back of a, a really 
really consistent run, uh, uh, not only of appearances on the PGA Tour, but then performances. You know, he played well um, uh, at the Dell recently. He played well in the weeks leading up, um, including, uh, you know, he played, you know, I, I thought quite well at the Arnold Palmer again at the Valspar. So Min Wu has, you know, carried the form of late last year on the European Tour. Um, particularly those couple of weeks in Spain where he's playing out of his skin. He's made the most of his opportunities on the PGA Tour to not just make weekends but then finish strongly through Sunday rounds. Uh, and he gets an invitation into the Masters um, off the back of last year. I remember being – we were so excited about him last year and it wasn't the only person in the history of the game to be humbled mm. by that course on their first walk around it. I think you'd be better for that this year. Uh, I'm not necessarily saying that I expect to see him, you know, in the top three or four names uh, yeah. when we get to the business end on on Monday morning Aussie time, but I wouldn't at all be surprised by a top 20, top 15 mm. finish from Minwoo, given his, his run at present and given, I think, the, the things that he would have learnt from that appearance last year. He's also got length. And he's a very good iron player, so two yeah. things that all that all stack up really well. So, yeah, I think um, I really think he's not the worst worst bet in the world for a top fifteen, top twenty. There is another. I'm going to claim you as Australian that's in the field. <laughs> Aldrich Potgita. I don't know if you've seen Aldrich's in there. So he won the African Open, um, and he is uh, South African born, but has been it's... raised raised here in uh, Australia for a, um, I think believe from when he was very young. Actually, coached by Glenn Paul uh, over here as well. So uh, friend of the the show, Glenn, uh, who's doing his own great thing. So yeah, won the African Amateur um, to to get into the field. So um, yeah, really good talent from from all reports. Haven't seen. Uh, him play in person, but uh, yeah, be a wonderful experience, I'm sure, for him. And the other person will, of course, mention um, not an Australian, uh, but an Australasian, mm. uh, Ryan Fox yes. in the field, the Kiwi, um, one of, if not the most consistent player on the European tour in the last three or four seasons, um, was admittedly disappointing in his major starts last year. Um, played, I believe, both the Open Championship and the US Open. Uh, so I think it'll be important for him to probably reaffirm how good he is. I don't think it's a secret, uh, but I, you know, I do know that he would have been disappointed with his performances at the end of a long year last year. So it'd be good to see Foxy get off to a much better start here, and and yeah, hopefully um, plays very well and represents the broader Australasian region. Uh, I think. Uh, as we'd like to say. Yeah. No, I think that is a good roundup of players. Rightio. Um, that brings us to our tips. Uh, I'd just like to point out um, the original and the best format here on the 19th. I've seen, I mean, we've seen the emergence of a number of um, golf podcasts here in the local Australian market of late. Mm. Uh, I have seen... Um, Several take on the format of uh, winners, uh, you know, providing a value bet, um, telling you who won't win. It's, okay. I mean, it's a tried and true formula. And as yeah. they say, imitation is the highest form of flattery, Drew. Yeah. So um, we've been doing it for a little while now. Uh, and it's the format that we like to see. So we will give you um, who we think will win, who we want to win. Uh, who won't win, uh, and a little bit of value, as we say, in the betting markets, of course, gamble responsibly if that's your pleasure. Uh, Drew, so let's kick off with uh, won't. I think that's always a good place to start. Who won't win? Okay, so mine uh, is one, two, three. The equal fifth favourite, uh, Patrick Cantlay, won't win. Okay, interesting. He's just no good. Simple. I've yeah. mentioned this after many, many times. He's got an awful Masters record. He's actually got an awful major record, to be honest. Um, three top tens in three, six, nine, 12, 15, 18, 23 attempts. So, yeah, I just don't think he's major material, to be honest. Um, 
He's in good form. I'll give him that. I mean, he's finished third at the Genesis, T4 at the Arnold Palmers, T19 at the Players, T9 at the the, the match play. Um, and, yeah, but in terms of some of the stats, I mean, you know, he's uh, sixth in strokes gained total and, and second in strokes gained off the tee, which are, which are really nice, but 41st in, in approach to the green and 45th in putting, which um, if you can't putt, then you're not really going to win majors and, and you're particularly not going to win the masters so i've gone uh pat cantlay at currently 19 dollars to not win mm. um so I, I agree with all of your points interestingly i mentioned the interview we did uh, that i listened to on the no laying up podcast he said that uh, he was asked specifically about his record at majors and what he thought was missing he said that he hadn't played that many which I found fascinating. Yeah, You've played 20, 23, Patrick. 23 attempts, Pat. Well, it's not, I, mean, I admire the fact that you think you've got a long career of majors ahead of you. Um, that's wonderful. Uh, and, you know, only good for us as golf fans. Not that I think you'll challenge at any of them. Uh, my only criticism uh, of your tip would be that it feels a little easy. Uh, yeah. Because wow. we've seen, <laughs> uh, we, we've got a, 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 a decent enough sample size now to say that he never wins. So yeah. that would be my only criticism. But the point is, to, the point is to, to take someone in the top five or ten favourites. True. And he's so one of them. Mine, who are you going? Mine's a little higher. Yeah. Um, I think, I think realistically. So th- this is how I looked at this. I think realistically. There are three genuine chances to win going into this tournament. I think there are several on the fringes of that trio who are good chances, um, and whether that's by virtue of history at this course, recent form, um, all factors that would lead to suggest that you know they'll be there and thereabouts. But I think there are three genuine chances. Mm. They happen to be the first three lines of betting, mm-hmm. and so. I picked the person out of that triangulate who I believe is least likely to win uh, this week. So I believe that John Rahm will not win mm. the Masters. I also believe this is not the first time I've selected John Rahm as won't win the <laughs> Masters. Um, and I've been proven to be correct. Sounds outrageous when you consider he's already won three times on tour this year and probably in any other year when he didn't have both... Rory McIlroy and Scotty Scheffler playing alongside of him. Um, You know, we'd be talking about him as the runaway favourite for this tournament. Uh, And if he wins another one, two, possibly even three times, he's talking about one of the great years and seasons on the tour in its Mm. history. Um, It's just happening at a time where we're so fortunate to be watching three of them do it. And I think not only because I think the other two are genuinely better chances of winning, I just think his form here albeit it shapes as a course that should suit him down to the ground. Mm. Uh, I don't know if it's a temperament thing. I don't know if it's a patience thing because you do have to be patient with this course. You can't rush it. Yeah, I just uh, comparatively, he doesn't fill me with confidence. So John Rahm won't win the 2023 Masters. Yeah, I definitely don't mind the the pick. I mean, it's it's so hard because, you know, Mm. all the stats point towards him being a, a really, yes. really, really good uh, chance to win, you know, yes. leading strokes gained, 28 strokes gained off the tee, fourth approach to green, 12th in putting, 15th in driving. Like, you know, he's, he's, he is playing exceptional, exceptional golf. So yeah, it's, um, it's tough. That's, um, it's a, it's a ballsy pick. That's the whole point of it. I like it. Um, but yeah, I'm sure by the same token, I'm, Sure, you probably wouldn't at all be surprised to see him wearing the green jacket at the time. No, <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't, and I wouldn't be unhappy about it either. Yeah, no, um, that's a good point. Good point. Who do you want to win? Well, I'm going a repeat offender here because I just think for the for the storylines that it will create, I'm going to put Rory here because it will obviously achieve so much in his career, and I think what it will do is just um crescendo an incredible 18 months of golf you know to to the way that he played in the majors last year the way that he played in the significant tournaments 
all while becoming a father for the first time while carrying the what seemed to be the burden of the PGA Tour while being the talking head of the PGA Tour in many respects and having all this additional stuff go on, I, I think it would just be a wonderful crescendo to cap off what has been a phenomenal 18 months for one of the generational talents of our game. Um, and for him to to finally do it in a year where there has been so much upheaval in the game will be really, really impressive. I know it's probably a cliched answer, um, but yeah, it's just kind of where where my head's at. And I, I honestly, I don't think there would be that many people. I know there are, there are people right now who have kind of fallen a little bit on on Rory, given that he's been out in the the public sort of with this whole live debate. Um, and part of me is wondering whether that's Rory being Rory or whether he's being pushed by the PGA Tour to do that. Different discussion. Um, but I, I truly don't think there would be that many people who would be disappointed and annoyed with Rory finally getting a green jacket. Like, I, I truly do believe that. And I and I honestly, I think that that would be, that would extend to the players who have gone to live as well. So Rory, Rory for me, I know it's a bit of a, a cliched one. No, you? no, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's really good, and I agree with all of what you've said. Uh, I think it would be a remarkable, remarkable. I wouldn't say full stop because it denotes the end. I, I think just a remarkable underline to what's been a, a reasonably significant eighteen months for him, mm. for all the reasons that you said. Um, I'm going to say Cameron Smith. Mm-hmm. Uh, for a variety of reasons, obviously, I've I've rarely felt as hollow watching a sporting event as to what I did twelve months ago when he buried his tee shot on twelve on Sunday in uh, Ray's Creek in front of the twelfth hole. That was as disappointed as I've been. Uh, I think for a long, long time watching a sporting event. Um, I felt really comfortable about where he was at up until that point. You know, he'd weathered a storm from Scheffler on the front nine. Yeah, he chips in from off the green early. I think that was the third hole last year. And the momentum seemed overwhelmingly with him. The, the crowd certainly did um, at that point. But Cam weathered it well. He finished the front nine strongly, gets through 10 and 11, and then... All he had to do, Droids, was stick it, stick it to the middle of the green, two putt, get out, and mm. he got a little, uh, got a little aggressive. So, I think for that reason, I think he's, I think he's due. Obviously, he was runner up to DJ in twenty twenty as well. Um, loves this course, tends to scrap more than he should. Like he gets himself into trouble a little bit off the tee. So, mm-hmm. if he can straighten up and give himself a bit better look on a more consistent basis, I think that'll go a long way. I am intrigued to see genuinely how he plays coming off the back of comparatively some pretty poor competitive golf. Mm-hmm. But that worries me less about him because I think there's an innate self-drive and yep. self-competitiveness in that person that it won't take long to get around these guys on the range this week and play a couple of practice rounds to – to switch on, so I'm, I'm not all that concerned about that, and I just think the story. Um, I think if there's anyone of the live group that you'd want to see win, it's probably him. I think mm-hmm. some others would be unbearable, <laughs> uh, not 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 just unpalatable, unbearable. Yeah, if they if they won, yeah, um, I think he is a more than acceptable representative of that group to be donning a green jack. I put DJ in that group as well. I don't think anyone would begrudge DJ winning a second um, given his impact on the game, but I think he would definitely be the most likable member of, of the Rebel Alliance um, yep. to win the tournament. Uh, I just think it'd be great for Australia to have a second um, champion of that tournament. So, yeah, Smithy for mine. Um, always hard to overlook Jordan, mm-hmm. uh, who I think is playing very well and has a remarkable record uh, recently on Easter Sunday. As yes. it relates to win, winning tournaments mm. um, on Easter Sunday, uh, so I mean it's a standing, 
pick, as you know, I always want Jordan Smith to win every tournament mm. that he enters. Um, mm. But yeah, well, I think I think Smithy would be a wonderful and deserving winner this year. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because he, yeah, as you said, it, it's the great unknown, and this is this is why I find it so difficult to to pinpoint where these players who are playing live golf are right because his last couple of performances have been not great as you said i think i'm mm. um, looking looking here 26th in tucson and 29th in orlando um of course you know going back to four round golf like all all of these factors make it really difficult to to kind of actually even go is this a genuine is this a genuine chance so um but as you rightly pointed out i think he will find that within himself more so than than finding it from other people whereas i think players on the that have gone to live perhaps need more lifting up externally players like brooks i think is certainly one of those um albeit he just won um but yeah it's it, it'll be fascinating i think uh, undoubtedly you know there's um it, it would be a phenomenal feat for australian golf particularly with the next live event being here in australia mm-hmm. in, in in a couple of weeks time i think it would be be fantastic um so yeah it'll be a, a true fascinating watch to see how Cam, um, as I guess the, the best player that Liv has in, in, in terms of world ranking um, and I guess more broadly what we kind of, you know, can see from the eye test, he's he's the best golfer that they have if, if he can perform. Um, I think. I, I hope he does because I, he, he is our best chance. He's, he's the best Aussie chance that we have um, and, and – you know, even though he's gone to a tour that is kind of irrelevant in in many ways, in in that's my personal opinion, um, I would still love for him to to win a major, yeah, another one. I think um, just to tie a bow on on Cam, he he has, I believe, a, an ability that very few athletes in any sport around the world have, and that. That is seemingly the ability to completely detach yourself from the result. Mm-hmm. Um, Ash Barty was very good at this um, during her tennis career, um, and and you see it a lot in Scotty Scheffler in the sense of he is he's he's great at staying in the moment, and he doesn't necessarily ironically define success as victory in a tournament. Mm. And, and I think, I think there's been two really recent examples of, of that manifesting itself in Cam. The first was last year at the masters. He was disappointed, but asked whether or not he regretted the shot choice on 12. It, it was an immediate, absolutely not. Mm-hmm. So like it, 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 most other people would get self-reflective and probably very, critical of themselves and down on themselves and his conviction, absolutely, absolutely not. And, and, I, and I'd do it again. Similarly, I think he has to be detached from the result to perform the way in which he did on the back nine at St. Andrews last year mm. when literally everyone, not only on the property, but in the golfing world wanted the other guy to win. Yeah. Literally everyone. Like the ability and the strength and the resolve to weather that and still come out the other side speaks to me about a person who, who is intrinsically in the moment, detached necessarily from the end result, and so invested in his process that ultimately it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. And he trusts that if he, he puts his best foot forward and he gets beat a day, so be it. But I couldn't have asked any more of myself. There's very few people who can do that in any sport. And I think he has that in spades, which I think – is perfect for this scenario because the rest is just noise. He'll come yeah. in and he'll play his golf for two days, hopefully four days, and hopefully be right there at the end. And the rest is just noise. Yeah. Yeah. That's what put be very interesting to watch. Um, we'll win. All right. Um, this was pretty tricky. Actually, I found this year. Normally I've, I, you know, have a, have a sort of a short list of, of people. Um, I think, you know, I've really resisted the temptation to put Scotty Scheffler down because 
you know, it's it's hard to to go past how he's playing. Even even John right. Rahm, right? Someone um like that. Um, there were plenty of guys up the top top of the leaderboard. Spieth, we we know loves this place. Um, I've actually I've gone for a guy in very good form. Um, and I've gone for a guy who has won a couple of times this season, and that's Max Homer. Um, okay. At talk to me about this. What a what a turn of events. I have, and I just want to preface all of this by saying I've never said he's not good. He just needed to get off Twitter, and he did that. <laughs> he did that, and all yeah. of a sudden he's had six career wins. It's all I'm saying. I have always liked him. I just think he yeah. needed to get off Twitter. Uh, Thirty-one dollars, actually paying more than uh, Jason Day. If, if, yes. Would you believe? So two wins this year. Um, he is uh, currently placed pretty well amongst all uh, of the key stat lines. He's third in strokes gained total, fifty-fourth strokes gained off the tee, but that's you know. Neither here nor there. Really. Well, he's not super long, really. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's right. what that speaks to more than anything else. Correct. Uh, fifth in strokes gained approach to T, which is obviously very important. Uh, and 10th in strokes gained putting. So, that is the sort of stuff that I love about Max Homer at the minute. Um, his results in majors are not great. He had a T13 mm. last year at the PGA Championship, and that, that was really the best. But I think he's he's really uh, turned a corner this year and he's kind of taken on a lot more of the um, – I, I almost feel like he's grown up in a lot of ways, right? He's, he's really started to focus more on his golf and it's showing that, you know, he's now got six career wins, two this season um, and two, two good tournaments as well, um, you know, one of them being the Farmers Insurance. Um, and – He's just in good form. T9 at the match play, T6 at the players, which is obviously, you know, a pretty difficult course as well. 14th at the Arnold Palmer, second at the Genesis. Um, even T39 at Phoenix Open isn't the worst. And then before that, won the Farmers Insurance, third at the Tournament of Champions, 17th at the Hero World Challenge, and fourth at the QBA shootout, both kind of irrelevant. But his worst result this year this season has been a T39 at the Phoenix Open. And mm. I just think that bodes really well um, for for someone who is playing very, very good golf and kind of gets the ability to fly in a little bit under the radar now with so much of the, the topic of discussion being focused around the live guys coming back and playing against the PGA guys with the whole Rory Grand Slam piece, is Ram up to winning it finally? Will Scheffler do it again? Like there's so many dominating headlines. Will JT pull his finger out? Will Spieth pull his finger out? Like it's there's so many things. And like Max Home is just kind of going along doing his thing. And I just think it it fits really nicely for him. Um is he the best player in the field? Absolutely not. Um but yeah I just think that there's I, I just, I don't know. I, that's where I'm going. Um, and yeah, I, I think it'd be a really, really impressive win if he got it done because yeah, as I say, his, ma his major record isn't great. So there's always holes that, that, uh, you know, we can poke in, in every tip. Um, so he's certainly not perfect. Um, but, uh, yeah, Max Homer is where I have landed for 2023. I like it. Uh, I'm glad that you were uh, upfront about the major record because it isn't mm. great. No. Um, what I would say is I think he's – I agree with you in the sense I think he's an entirely different player this year than he's probably ever previously been. I think we've seen streaks of it mm -hmm. um, without the ability to play it consistently over four days and then probably even more significantly consistently week to week. Uh, and that string of – results that you've rattled off there this year I think speaks volume to the improvement uh, up to I believe a career high sixth in the world rankings mm -hmm. if you're into the world rankings um, mm -hmm. you know they are a, a marker not the marker but sure. a marker of form and I think you're right I think he enters this tournament 
full of self belief and absolutely should. I mean, he's he's on the he's on the press conference list. That's only reserved for mm. ten to twelve players, and that's mm. a reflection of obviously he's standing in the eyes of, um, you know, the tournament directors as well, um, and they've got a pretty good finger on the pulse of who matters and who's playing well. So, look, I think it's a great tip, um, and I I love him. I I think he's not just a fantastic player. I think he's fantastic for the game. So. I would certainly not be disappointed to see him um, pull on the green jacket on Monday morning Australian time. Uh, and I think he's certainly got the game to do it at this course. So we shall see. But it's it's not by any stretch of the imagination a laughable tip. Good for no, me. I, well I'll, I'll, I'll add one one thing just on Max Homer. I've, I also feel there is weirdly um, an element of who he gets paired with will have an impact on how he plays. So, um for example, uh, not that I think it will happen, but you know, if he was to play alongside like a Tiger or even like a JT or someone like that, I feel like that may rattle him. Like it's not necessarily going to drive him along to be a better player. And if particularly if the guys that he's playing with start playing well, he almost feels like he needs to beat them in a in a match play situation almost. So, um. Yeah, I, you know, my tip could be out the window in the first day if he ends up being paired with someone significant. Um, but yeah, I, it's, it was just a point that I thought probably doesn't apply to too many players. Um, but yeah, I think think Max Max Homer might be one of those. Anyway, who have you got? I think the yeah, other well, I just just one other point on Max. I think he plays his best golf chasing yeah. someone down mm-hmm. rather than being out in front. Um, so I would be really confident if I was sitting in your seat and he's three shots off the lead mm. um, after 54 holes. Yeah. And and that's what he's, you know, he's in the third to fourth last group um, and, and that's his prospect as opposed to having the magnifying glass on him as part of the last group. Yeah. So, no, totally. Totally. Yeah, it's a good tip. Really good tip. Uh, so me, yes. Uh, I think I think I think Rory McIlroy is going to win the twenty twenty three Masters. Awesome. Um, so let me um, control C, control V, all the things that you said about why you want him to win, because that that's uh, it 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 rings true for me as well. Yeah. And um, why do I think he will? Why do I think he will win? So last year. And I acknowledge from the outset, the round that he played on Sunday um, was unique in so many different respects. I think it was a 63 in the end. Uh, he finished second overall, um, his mm. best finish in his career at Augusta National last mm. year. Um, now, yes, there is certainly an argument to be made, and I would listen to it, that he played that well, particularly on the back nine, because there was literally no pressure. Like, he went out... I think he started the day seven or eight shots back um, from Scotty Scheffler uh, and really the chains were off. Like what's there to lose? And that's often when Rory plays his best golf, he did it against Xander in the singles match play at the Ryder Cup when he'd had an absolute, played like a busted ass at the Ryder Cup and got thrown out in a crucial singles match and wiped the floor with Xander who was red hot across that weekend because he had nothing to lose. So he often plays his best golf in that scenario. He is quite literally the opposite of nothing to lose this week. Not only is he carrying in the, uh, I suppose, the performance pressure of chasing seemingly the endless chase for a grand slam, I think he's also carrying the burden of the leadership pressure that some might argue he's brought upon himself in the past you know, six to 12 months. But to your point, um, he stood out the front when no one else would, um, whether that was at the direction of the PGA whether it was at the direction of his um, fellow um, PGA Tour loyalist and leader, Tiger Woods. So I think it's probably much more likely that's where the urging came from rather than, say, Jay Monaghan. Mm-hmm. I think Rory tells Jay what to do rather than the other way around. <laughs> um, he carries an enormous burden coming into this week, but I can't ignore how he played last year. You simply cannot ignore the way in which... I mean, I probably haven't seen... Tiger 97, probably, and then maybe 2000, 2001 and his back-to-back wins in the turn, turn of the century. Like, 
players who've honestly dominated that course. There aren't many, there aren't many people. That, there are people who have good runs of holes. There aren't too many people who own the course over the period of 18 holes, um, you know, or 36 or 54. DJ did it in unique circumstances at a different time of year when conditions were entirely different to what they usually are. So that was an anomaly. The way that Rory played on that Sunday last year is is so difficult to ignore. And I think irrespective of all the water that's gone under the bridge in the time since, it would be difficult in his shoes not to walk back in there and that be such an easy recall, the mm. immediate memory. I, I get the sense that for players like him, that place is a very safe place in mm. the sense there probably aren't too many other places in the world where you can go there and feel completely cut off because everyone walking around in a green jacket is welcoming and warm and friendly because you're such an important figure for them within their club. It's in many respects, the most important tournament outside of an open at St. Andrews in all of golf. Mm. And he is the game's most important figure in many ways. So I think it's a safe place for him. And I think it's a place he goes back to. And as I said, can't help but walk in and be flooded with the memories of playing so well. Mm. His last outing there. So I think in many respects, the, collective wave i know that you said there are people and there certainly are people who aren't necessarily his biggest fan ironically a lot of them from australia which i find strange mm. um mm. that's a topic for another time uh I, I think he will ride that because there's probably few this popular guys your tip max home is certainly one of them the, the crowd would i think eventually come sunday if he emerges as the person be thrilled and mm-hmm. you know w- would make for a wonderful walk down 18. There's not many players who I think would carry that momentum from a crowd perspective from you know Friday lunchtime if it looks mm. like they're on a bit of a run. And he's one of them. There's probably a group of two or three who would do that. And I think if if he looks likely, and and we all know what it is with Rory, he's just got to get through Thursday. Yeah, realistically, like the guys at the top of the leaderboard at Thursday are probably going to be. If it's a good day and they get out early in the first wave, somewhere between four under and six under, depending on how good their day is. That's generally where the leaders sit after day one. He's just got to break even, to be honest. Yep. Particularly if we think the weather's going to go the way it's going to go. Yes. If he can just get through even par, then we are off to the races, in my mind, for the remainder of the weekend, and anything could happen. So it's the first round as critical as we know with him in majors specifically at Augusta National, I just think there's something, um, all the facts and figures and the way he's playing point to it because ironically right now it's Scotty Scheffler and just before Scotty Scheffler it was John Rahm, but just before John Rahm there's a period of time when we're talking about Rory as the best player in the world. Mm -hmm. And I've just mentioned two other players have had that mantle since, but that was literally only like four months ago. It wasn't actually all that long ago. Yeah, It's been stupidly... um, immense couple of months of golf for those three. Mm. So the game is there. I think the momentum is there. I think the desire is there not only for him, but I think for the broader game to see it happen. And I just think, yeah, I think if it becomes a mental battle on Sunday between him and a few others, there's there's a depth that he has that, that few others do. Uh, and I can't see truly... Um, I can't see him letting what happened to him at St. Andrews happen again. Mm. Now, in many respects, it was out of his control. He didn't he didn't play his best golf in that final round. Cameron Smith played one of the best back nines on a Sunday we've seen in recent memory at a major. So mm. it took a huge round from an individual to take it from him. But that would have left some deep, deep scar tissue, which I can't see a player of Rory's calibre allowing to happen again. No, you're you, you're right. Um, and it's almost, you know, I was thinking while you were talking then, it, it's almost like a Stockholm syndrome, right? Like in the like in the last 18 months. <laughs> we keep going back. Yeah, he's just had so much like pain and bullshit that he's just had to deal with. But ironically, he's played arguably the best golf of his career, right? Like Correct. early on, he played phenomenal golf and, and, and he was a, a 
and he is a generational talent, right? But I, I look back, and I know it's not the same stage, but I look back to the, to the Middle East there against Patrick Reed, right? Like there was this storyline from before the tournament even started that Rory's a bit of a sook and blah, blah, blah. And then for it to come down to Reed and Rory in, in coming down the last hole and, and Pat was in the – Pat Reed was in the – the sheds already and and then Rory drained this 15 20 foot part like just like it seems to drive him where it would make others falter and that bodes very very well for this week with all the rhetoric that's going around right Agreed. um the only thing that you could say about Rory right is that he's currently ranked 175th in strokes game putting and that's that's a concern. There's no doubt. But as you said, if he gets through the first round, even par one under, within a sniff, right? Game on. You like mm-hmm. you could you could pay out almost because if that putter shows up this week, the rest of the game's good. The rest of the game is in as good a place as it can be. He's he's melting the ball off the tee. He's got he's leading the driving distance on the PGA tour. He's very accurate. His irons are are outstanding. The wedges seem to have turned up. If that putter comes to play, it's it'll be game over. He could he could win by seven or eight shots easily. You know what I mean? Like, and we and we do know that he's made some changes in that space. So he has made some yeah. um, recent equipment changes. He's he's changed the length of the shaft and his driver, but he's also switched to a blade. Yeah. Um part of we've seen him for years and years now with the mallet. Um and he's he's recently made the switch to a blade putter. Whether or not that's happened in enough time um, prior to Augusta remains to be seen, but he's he's looked to address the specific problem you've referenced. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Look, I think I, I'm 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 probably only as confident as this as I am in any of these tips that I make um, leading into a literal crapshoot that is a Masters. Mm. Um, but it's I don't know. It's I think it's got some got some juice this one. Yeah. I, I think it's oh. uh, yeah. If it's going to happen, I think this is the year. I'm bu- I, I'm bullish. I'm very bullish. I'd be buying Rory stock for sure, right? Like he's, mm. it's it, it. It appears that there's this second lease on life in terms of golf, and and it and it's come during his toughest off year, off off course year. Um, mm. and as I said, with the storylines all being around live and the return and everything that Rory is going to have to put up with this week maybe that takes him to a different level again and, and he does run away and win it. So I, I, I love the pick. I would also not be surprised if he's four over par after six holes. <laughs> <laughs> Nor would I. Uh, no. <laughs> sadly, I would not be surprised in the slightest. Uh, and good. so that leaves us That leaves us with finding some value mm-hmm. for our loyal listeners. Um a little difficult in the sense that a lot of the guys, for me, probably didn't quite reach the criteria or prerequisites mm. for what I d- determined or deemed to be value. Um, but I'll, I'll run through some names uh, after you give me yours, Drissa, your roughy, your value tip. Well, um, you would have had to have actually scrolled down on the leaderboard to find someone because your tips that you've given so far are uh, inside the t- <laughs> all inside the top five names that are, that are on this uh, provider that I'm looking at. Um, Correct. My roughies actually uh, drifted this afternoon. When I first looked, it was okay. it was thirty four dollars out to forty one now. Um, but purely for the fact that I just cannot ignore his major record, I know he's been in some. Uh, he hasn't been in great form. He's been battling a little uh, bit of injury, but I'm yes. going Will Zalatoris. Um, I just think, you know, he's he's played in ten majors. He's made the cut seven times. Six of those he's finished in the top twenty-five. The the only outsider of that was a T twenty-eight, um, and he's finished second three times. Uh, so, yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I'm not. I'm certainly not. Uh, bullish on on the pick, but I just think it's he just cannot be ignored anymore when it comes to these picks. And at forty one dollars, I think it's well and truly overs. If there's a, I haven't looked if there's a top twenty market or anything like that. If there's a top twenty market, I'd certainly be looking 
um, at something in that space. He's currently ranked 136th in the putting, which is obviously awful. Um, and we know that that's been a weakness of his game for quite some time, but the rest of the rest of it looks pretty good. So yeah, I'm, um, I am, I'm going to side with Will Zalatoris. Likes this course too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, has played well. Was it Hideki's year that he finished? Second? It was. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, look, it's a good tip. Um, the, the putter is oh, it's awful, <laughs> ga- ghastly. So, <laughs> all all I would say is, I hope he is either holding out on his approach, <laughs> or sticking it real like, close. <laughs> well, no, that's that's where that's where the problems are. So, true, like, he true. seems to. I was going to say, like, either holding out or not putting it within eight foot of the pin. <laughs> he seems to putt quite well from like ten to fifteen feet. But anywhere inside eight feet is horrific. Um, so, look, I think it's yeah, it's really good, other than the putter, um, which is yeah. difficult to ignore. I'll be interested to see how he goes. He's obviously played a few tournaments now, coming back from that significant back injury. I believe there was some surgery involved mm-hmm. in that um, process. There are a few courses on tour. Um, mind you, he played Riv. I was going to say that ask more of the body over four rounds. Then Augusta National, um, he did oh, play, absolutely <laughs> play riff. So that that will be interesting to see. But no, I like it. It's a good tip. Um, Who have you got? Yeah, for, well, for me, like as I said, it was difficult. There's a couple of honourable mentions. Um, Please, I really like Tony Fina going mm-hmm. into this tournament. Uh, way too short for value at 23. Yes, but I thought he was worth a mention. Um, similarly, Cameron Young uh, at 26 dollars wasn't enough for me. Um, but has played exceptionally well, of course, made it through, um, ultimately was um, absolutely wiped by Sam Burns in the final of the match yeah. play, but um, did topple the best player in the world currently on his way to the final of the match play. Um, I like Sung Jae-im at $36. I really like Matt Fitzpatrick at 46 That That seems overs. I mean, yeah, he's in the wilderness a bit with a, some concerns around his own back. But, yeah, as you say, US Open... Winner last year, so um, seems crazy overs at forty six. Um, I mentioned your weather report that had me looking at a few other options. So I really like two guys at fifty six dollars, and that's Shane Larry and Tommy Fleetwood. Mm-hmm. Probably more so Shane Larry, but Fleetwood's form in the last um, four or five tournaments has certainly turned a corner. Um, both play well in um, specifically windy conditions, so I don't mind either of those. But I'm going to go a little further. Usually my sweet spot is kind of like in the 60s and 70s. Mm-hmm. I don't like um, any of Joaquin Neiman, Patrick Reed, or Tiger Woods, which is the first <laughs> time we've actually mentioned Tiger in this entire podcast. Great to see him mm-hmm. back in the field. Mm-hmm. Um, and as we often say, enjoy this. It may well be the last time you see him play with us the national. So enjoy it um, because it continues to be a gift that we get to see it. I don't like any of them, to be honest. Okay. So my Ruffy at... Yes. One hundred and one dollars mm-hmm. is Siwoo Kim. Okay, so you might recall two thousand and twenty-one uh, outstanding first round. Uh, more than halfway through the second round, he was two strokes off the lead when, uh, following a three-putt bogey on the fourteenth hole, he snapped his putter mm. uh, and had to putt out the remainder of the round with his three wood, uh, which he did reasonably well. Uh, I think he actually managed a birdie in the last five holes putting with the three wood, but the wheels fell off the remainder of the tournament. All I hear in all of that, Drew, is, is, is was, he was within two shots of the lead halfway through Friday. Yep. So he's a guy that can get hot. He was unbelievable. He wasn't the star of the President's Cup last year. That was undoubtedly his countryman in Tom Kim. Mm-hmm. Uh, little Tommy the Tank Engine. But I think Siwoo was an underrated star. You know, absolutely fucking dismantled JT in the singles, mm-hmm. which was awesome to watch. Um, he's a big stage player, is Siwoo. And at $101, I love him. Maybe not necessarily for the win, but mm-hmm. Jesus, I shudder to think what he's paying for like a top 20 yeah. 
or, or even a top five to make, that 101. Make, make the cut, you'd probably get some value. Yeah, bit of value. So C, Wu, Kim, write it down. I like it. Um, I got a couple others honorable mentions that I didn't give out at mine. Sorry. Um, yes. A guy I just think to to make the cut won't won't probably compete that heavily, but to make the cut at 176, Brian Harmon seems overs for a course Under. that that left handers generally play well at. I yes. think uh, that's overs. Um, sorry, that was really the only one. The only other player that I wanted to mention that we have just we've ignored in all of this, and given. Uh, there is obviously such a focus on iron play here, particularly with the weather we're about to expect. And if it's soft uh, or softer than what we're used to seeing, Colin Morikawa could yeah, could win this thing very easily. Um, we know he's obviously a dual major champion already at a very young age. So, yeah, I, I think um, he's he's a potential option. 26 is is way too short for obviously this this section of the show but mm. uh, yeah I just think it's worth mentioning mentioning Colin Morikawa kind of needs to as well respectfully mm-hmm. of a two-time major winner in his early 20s he's done nothing since no. the 2021 open championship but like nothing mm-hmm. um needs to we need to start to see a bit from Colin yeah agree um because he Drew an awful lot of fucking airtime on full swing, uh, and that doesn't necessarily correlate um, to yeah. performance. Not that yeah. it did for everyone. I mean, so did Joel Damon, but Joel Damon's funny, and Colin yeah. Morikawa isn't. Yeah. So, yeah, we need to see a bit more from Colin, uh, respectfully, of course. So, yeah, I, I I agree. I think um could be the week, particularly with the conditions the way they're looking. Yeah. Uh, that'll do us, I think. Yes. It's yes. been a comprehensive uh, return. So we'll be back, of course, with the wrap. Um, things are friendly with the oh, – probably the uh, first time we've mentioned this as well. Unbelievable timing with Masters falling on the Easter <laughs> weekend here in Australia. So Huge. I have said to um, Anthea, my lovely wife, uh, she'll be lucky to see me across the four days. Probably won't be missing a shot. I wouldn't imagine. Yeah. Um, won't have to worry about, you know, can I can I hide the stream in a small window of my computer desktop on Monday morning at work? Uh, we won't have to worry about that this year. No, so, you will not. Um, note to, you know, whoever determines the Easter weekend in Australia, could we do this every year? Any <laughs> danger? Because this is wonderful timing. So we'll be back, of course, with a, a, a wrap of the 2023 Masters. And as we flag at the very top, um, some other episodes coming um, in the very near future. We'll do a review of the Australian summer uh, and also a review of Truth's trip to the US. Yes. And then uh, and then we'll see what's ahead of us. So plenty coming down the pipeline. Truth, as I said at the start, it's been great to have you back. It's been wonderful to be back in the years of our listeners. We do thank you for your patience and your loyalty these past few weeks around the sporadic programming. But as Truth's alluded to, there were some excellent um, albeit semi-regular episodes in that time so if you, if you haven't listened to them um, we would encourage you to do so particularly uh, the episode uh, with our good friend Paired Up Golf um, which yes. will hold extra elements of the story that will come by virtue of your honeymoon and a special day in Nashville so we will review all of that and more next week but wrap your ears around that if you haven't already enjoy Masters Week Drudes um it is undoubtedly one of the greats on the calendar and the same to all of our listeners at home. We'll be back in your ears next Monday evening. <laughs>